And we are live. Thank God it is Friday. Hey, I want to thank everyone for uh, joining me uh, this Friday. This is May 10th, I think. Anyhow, um, Gretchen Gallaudet, thank you very much for tuning in. Steve A. Bourbon Insane. Uh, Vito is in the house as well. I'm um, uh, Jack of All Blades. Thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, let's see what else we had in here earlier. Um, -da -dun -dun. And we'll see what else shows up later on. All right. So really, really enjoying Texas month. But I kind of wonder if a little bit uh, in terms of the whiskey world and people's perceptions is I, I kind of wonder if I'm, I might be a little bit ahead of the frontier of the game. But people's really like they really haven't come on the scene enough to where people are really getting the vibe that I'm getting. Like, I'm super excited. I think it's awesome. Loving these whiskeys. And I'm, I have a feeling most people right now are just kind of going, Texas, you know. Doug, Chris Hope, thank you very much for tuning in. Go ahead. Thank you very much for tuning in. But it has been absolutely awesome. Just with the five distilleries that I visited, and I'm hoping to visit more. And also, I think one of the issues is there isn't right now a lot of distribution. There's only like five different producers that you can regularly get everywhere. Um, and so out of the five that I can find locally, only five. Four of them have a tasting room. So we'll get more into that in just a, a little bit. Tamar, thank you much for uh, tuning in. So uh, last week I had um, uh, Waylon on, from who is the CEO of the Texas Whiskey Association, and they have the uh, Texas Whiskey Trail. This week I have another member of the Te Texas Whiskey Association, and he's also one of the uh, power, power trio uh, of cast strength, uh, Josh Galladay. Josh, why don't you say hello to everybody in the chat? Hey, what's going on, everybody? Glad to be here. And, and we have Jason the National Jump tuning in. Thank you very much. Oh, hey, man. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, before you get started, Eric, I just wanted to say big congratulations on getting over 2,000 subscribers. That's amazing. Oh, thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. Um, it, it, but it doesn't. This didn't come just from my own efforts. Although I've been, I've been working my ass off. I've been working really hard. Been putting a lot of content. I've been trying to improve my content. I think I'm choosing some really unique themes. Did Isla Month, Bourbon Month. Now we're doing Texas Month. Um, next month in June, I'll talk more about this later. Next month in June is going to be a, a super uber geeky study month because I'll be preparing to go to the Edinburgh Whiskey Academy in in July. Um, so I'll be putting out a video every single day uh, in relation to that. When I come back from Scotland, I'm actually going to do a course on, on, on my channel on uh, sensory analysis and uh, detective taste and method, bringing over what I learned from the Court of Master Small A's over into, over into the whiskey world. But again, yeah, thank you very, very much. Uh, it's been a community effort. Uh, Rod Gut Review, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. Hey, Ed. Yeah, Ed's in the house. Good to see you. So, Rod Cut, his first name is Ed? Yeah, Ed O'Meara. Okay. Yep. All right, Ed, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. So, one of the things I like to do, and I know it can become a little bit repetitive. People are hearing my story all the time, um, but my live streams are about the journey. I want to know what people's past were, where they came from, how they got into whiskey, what they're currently doing, whether they're they're a, a producer, uh, a, you know, working at a distillery, or uh, doing a fellow a whiskey tuber and then about their future and what they've got going on. So last night I recorded uh, a premiere video with Jared Hempstead. He is the master distiller for Balcones. Uh, that video will be going uh, as a premiere tomorrow uh, on Saturday. But before that, I will do sort of a live introduction that will lead us up into that. So I might do like a 15-minute to 30-minute introduction live stream, and then boom, we can all watch the premiere together. So that's sort of the pattern I like to follow. Most people know, you know, of 20 years working in wine uh, or as a part-time, been into wine, um, became a certified sommelier, been a, became a French wine scholar, uh, did the uh, Wine Spirit Educational Trust Diploma Program. Part of the diploma program was spirits. One of the units was on spirits, and that's how I got my foot into whiskey. So then rather than going on to become a master of wine, I took a detour and got into whiskey. So um, that's in a, in a nutshell how I got into whiskey. So why don't you tell me a little bit about your background in whiskey and how you got into this? Sure, absolutely. Uh, I, you know, I spent a number of years uh, being in the um, 
sort of craft beer and home brewing scene in Austin and uh, just hanging out with a lot of those people, visiting a lot of the breweries. And, and uh, that, was, that was kind of our regular happy hour after work. Uh, my office happens to be next to a, a handful of the craft breweries that are in the area here. So spent a lot of time learning about that and, and being involved in that community and, and started trying whiskeys. And uh, you know, at first I really had no idea what I was tasting, no idea what, what categories, what I didn't know my scotch from my bourbon or anything like that, right? Um, so eventually, after trying a bunch of different things, somebody handed me a pour of a Texas bourbon called Garrison Brothers. And I was blown away by it. I wasn't quite ready to fully appreciate it at that time, I think. It was a little aggressive, a little high proof for me. I, I didn't have the palate for it yet. But as I kept coming back and trying it, I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, you got a bottle right there. Uh, yeah, so Garrison Brothers was the first one I visited. Um... Uh, when I landed in in uh, in Texas and really really loved it, but I'll get into that in another video. Sure, yeah, and and that's actually I I had visited all of the breweries in town and and spent a bunch of time there, and I thought, well, I mean, this is made here as well. Why don't I go and see where Garrison Brothers is made? Because I've developed a taste for this this Texas whiskey. It's so different and unique from everything else that I've had. So um, we went out to High Texas and visited the Garrison Brothers Distillery. It was blown away. It's a beautiful property, amazing tour. They make really great Texas bourbon. And I thought, well, I mean, if this was great, let's go check out a few of the others. My, my wife wanted to go to uh, the Magnolia Silos up in, in Waco, Texas. Okay. Um, so we went up there and visited them. And, and after, after indulging her shopping for the day, uh, I said, you know, I, I heard about this distillery that's that's nearby here called Balcones. We should go in and check it out. So the first time I ever tried Balcones was at the distillery and, and I had uh, had their brimstone. I don't know if you got a chance to try that when you were here. No, but I have seen it on the market, but I haven't tried that one. So that was so unique because it's an, a corn whiskey, blue corn whiskey that's been oak smoked. Right. So I was so blown away by that. I was excitingly te texting friends as we were leaving the distillery. Say, this thing tastes like distilled brisket whiskey here. So, you know, that that just kind of got me on the hook at that point. I was I was uh, all in. So, I've you know, I've been to the majority of the distilleries on the Texas Whiskey Trail and a, and, and a few others. There's only only, I think, four at this point that I haven't actually been to. Yeah. So there they'll be in the near future. All right, so I just got a $10 chat from one of my neighbors. I don't have a bell, a drum, or anything, but uh, oh, cheers. there you go. Santa Cruz, and thank you very much. So uh, Santa Cruz, the town, is sort of south of where I live, but up and over a mountain. Uh, and we actually met mm -hmm. up at a distillery down there in Santa Cruz. So Santa Cruz, and thank you very much uh, for uh, the donation. A couple other people have joined in. So uh, Matt, and I don't, well, I'm guessing Matt, from the uh, Whiskey Crusaders. Yeah. Uh, Donald Rance has uh, joined in. Uh, Dustin um, D8 Silve has uh, joined in. And oh, the Kilton Moose. Thank you very much for uh, joining in. And the Whiskey Den has joined in. Thomas Buck. Thank you very much for uh, joining in. And Guy Davis. How are you doing, sir? Thank you very much for joining. All righty. So continue on with the journey. Sorry. <laughs> sure, sure. So, uh, you know, as as a result of uh, getting into this Texas whiskey scene a little bit, I, I, I attended a friend's birthday party and, and long story short, somebody told me about the guys at the Whiskey Vault. So I started checking out their videos and, and learning a whole lot more about how whiskey is made in the different categories and how to appreciate it and all these things uh, that they're, they're so good at teaching. And then and learning a lot about how a, uh, how a great whiskey community should be. And uh, now I got Vito. Now I got Vito. So we were talking smack about Vito before we went live. <laughs> in fact, now, in fact, now, now that I have uh, Josh on, I've already had Vito on. So Vito on. So my our goal is actually I've already worked this out with Chad. Later on, I'm gonna have Chad on, and Chad and I are gonna do a whole hour of just talking smack about you guys. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, if you knew how much smack we talk about Vito all the time in our little group chat on a regular basis, I mean, he's used to it. He's sure, used to it. sure. Um, hey, what, what do they call him, the, the Whiskey Pixie? The Whiskey Pixie, a, a nickname that was bestowed upon him by Rex Williams. Right, right, right. Anyway, yeah, recent episode there's where uh, I guess he said like a horse head, sort of a an homage to uh, the Godfather. That's and, right. 
Yeah, uh, Daniel had it on his hand. That was freaking hilarious. Yeah, uh, that's right. Anyhow, back to by the way. So I'm so what I have poured here. Uh, this uh, so I, when I the last distillery I went to was uh, Iron Root um, Republic. I got two cask pours. So this came straight from the cask in here mm -hmm. and with an autograph. So I've had a little bit before. So this isn't my first uh, neck pour. This is the Iron Root Harbinger. This puppy is aged 24 months. It tastes. Mm -hmm more like four or five years. We'll get into that. This is at 60.5% alcohol by volume. Yep. Shamoleons. <laughs> <laughs> and it says BBC uh, edition. Uh, and that's not British, British broadcasting system. No, uh, that'd be yeah. bloody butcher corn. Oh, bloody butcher corn. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. I, when I see BBC, I think, you know, the British Broadcasting uh, Channel. Right. Anyway, it's absolutely superb. However, at 60.5, it's intense. It's big. It's also a little bit warm today, and I hope no one's going to be offended, but I'm going to put this on some ice to cool it down and to bring back the AB. Just BV. Just a little bit. Now, I've already tasted it. It's absolutely superb. At this high of, of, of our alcohol and this intensity and flavor, a little bit of ice isn't going to kill it. Right, and well, I hey, you know, we, review. I'm just enjoying it. And we're just hanging out. Yeah, we, we we all know the best whiskey is the whiskey you like to drink. How you like to drink it, right? Nope, the best whiskey is the one you got for free. <laughs> that also true. Also <laughs> true, regardless of how you're drinking it. <laughs> so that's cool. You got a you got a single barrel essentially of uh, of the Harbinger. Oh yeah, I, I mean, it, not only single, yeah, it was immediately straight from the barrel. I was there when the, when the, when they did it. It was straight from the barrel, and then the autograph just sealed it up and. And then I was uh, out the door. That's so, great. So I hung out with them for about I don't know six to eight hours, something like that. Um, it was it was a Sunday gig. Nobody else came in. over there. Hey, the Whiskey Tribe is in the house. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, hey, is that Rex? I'm, uh, I'm guessing it's Rex. I'm guessing. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you very much for uh, uh, joining in, sir. Yeah. So um, anyway, so let's back. Let's get back to the story. So where are you coming from? How you got it? How you got into whiskey? Um, how did so there's two Canadians and then yourself as part of the the uh cast strength, right? Yes, that's correct. So, um, I, I first went down to uh the Wizard Academy and you know met Daniel and, and Rex at the Whiskey Vault as a result of a, a gift from my wife Gretchen that uh, was an anniversary gift to go and do a bourbon tasting in the vault. And uh, so after after that time, I got involved in their community and, and really enjoyed that and got to be friendly with uh, with Vito and Brad. Um, when Crowded Barrel had their launch party late last year, those guys came down and we spent a bunch of time together. And and uh, in order to keep in touch, we were doing just what you and I are doing now. We're doing the uh, just Google Hangouts because, of course, those guys live in two different cities in Canada and I'm down here in Austin. Uh, so we were doing that to keep in touch and we kept joking around that, hey, we should do this as a podcast or a channel or something because we're just, you know, for hours on end, just drinking whiskey and talking whiskey and, and having a good time. And, and uh, finally, that came together into having an actual YouTube channel. So, right. so last last week on Friday, um, I was on Bill, the Whiskey Dicks channel, mm -hmm. along with uh, the Mash and Drum, Jason Mash and Drum. Um, Chris from Bourbon Insane and I Whiskey She Wines. Yeah, we were on. The, we were live for three and a half hours. I caught some of that. That was amazing. It was <laughs> unbelievable. But the thing is, it didn't end after three and a half hours. When, when we when we stopped the stream, we were still going on and on for another hour. And some <laughs> of the content from that other hour was gold. It, it, but but it right. was, the whole thing was fantastic, and nothing was planned. It was sort of just ad hoc everybody's going at it but uh, we had an absolutely fantastic time but it's it but what i'm getting at is what went on in that hour would have been awesome on the live stream as well and so i think actually more people who just like to hang out do a virtual bar or virtual pub as as, as roy calls it mm -hmm. it's an off you can do a channel that when which that's all you do you just get a bunch of people together to hang out because people like to do that you know I consider a lot of these people who I've gotten to know at friends and I've traveled a lot trying to get to know people traveling to, you know, Indianapolis, try to go to, uh, went to Kansas, been to Texas, uh, went down to San Diego to meet, meet up with Bill, <coughs> excuse me, who flew up from Massachusetts, you know, go down to Santa Cruz. 
So it's just, I think, a great way to do this. Even if you aren't trying to be a whiskey tuber, it's still a great platform, a way to just sort of, you know, hang out. Some. Someone could do a whole channel where it was just focused on just doing uh, that that one thing. Anyhow, so yeah. um, so you guys formed this channel, and I kind of think if you guys were all in the same neighborhood, so like the Scotch Four Dummies, they literally live on the same street. Right. Um, they, yeah. they could borrow each other. One time Mark, so they, they record from um, Sean's house, and one time during the live stream, Mark ran home to get a bottle and ran, and ran back, you know, like a few, like in a couple of minutes, you know. Uh -huh. um, and they could borrow each other's lawnmowers, and they do barbecues and when you know off camera and you know birthdays and everything. Else. So for three guys who don't live anywhere near each other to then form a channel, I think that's pretty unique and that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's it's definitely interesting and and uh, you know it's challenging at times too. I mean the. the None of us knew anything really about you know producing video, and we're still clearly uh, amateurs at that whole um, at that whole thing. But uh, the, you know, it's it's not really uh, so much about um, our channel's not so much about being slick and professional. We're always trying to get better, but it's so much more about the, that community that you're describing, right? It's so much more. Uh, it's incredible how when you discover somebody is really into their whiskey, it doesn't really matter if you're uh, next door or in, in another country. I mean, I've had conversations with, with Roy in Scotland and, you know, all these guys are just incredibly supportive, incredibly uh, just engaging and friendly. And um, I think that's kind of the most amazing part of the whiskey community, uh, especially on, on leveraging something like YouTube, right? Yeah, te technology and alcohol seems to be able to give us to be able to ability to, uh, Bridge the time of, of gaps, of personalities, uh, cultures, <laughs> and everything else. Exactly. That's the amazing part of it. I just noticed a couple of other people that came in the chat. We got uh, one of our moderators, the uh, the priestess of Pete, as they know her, Christine yeah, Zerpoli. Uh, and then I also saw uh, Sarah Whelan, who's uh, Spencer's wife, who was just on, on your channel. So. And she Matt, I don't know if I, Matt, Matt is in the house as well, Chris, uh, Whiskey Crusaders. Yeah, Matt Zetrick up in uh, up I'm going to have the Whiskey Crusaders on in a couple of weeks uh, as, as well. Um, and I will be dipping into some samples uh, that Matt provided uh, when I was down there. So uh, you and Chad have also done the Whiskey Psalm course and don't necessarily want to get all the details of that. Have you found that thus far, you think, helpful and just, if nothing else, being a whiskey tuber in that kind of setting, being able to apply at least some of what you've got there as being a whiskey tuber? Yeah, from the from the sum course, absolutely. Uh, for me, I I as far as learning whiskey bullet point facts, things that you could you could put on a quiz or a test or something like that. I, I knew a lot of that stuff already, although I, I did learn plenty in that class that was that was that was new to me. I was pretty familiar with whiskey production and the uh, traditions in different countries and some of the history and all of that. Um, so for me personally, although that that type of information in the course was very rich. Um, there's sections on food pairing, there's sections on public speaking, there's sections on uh, effective writing and uh, marketing and all of these other interesting things that, that you, they always apply back to whiskey, right? right? It's always in a whiskey context and always trying to promote a, a positive, inclusive uh, community around whiskey. Um, but yeah, that that to me was the biggest benefit, I think, uh, well, of anything else. So, I mean, I, I have, as we're talking about off screen, I have thousands of books sitting right over here. Mm -hmm. I have a ton of books sitting right down here. I got lots of degrees, lots of certifications. I've taught college, I've taught high school. Um, but here's the thing is, regardless of the subject, regardless of the class, every one of them is just an introduction. You know, right. if you have, if you have a class that's three nights a week, two, two hours per class, so you've got six hours of in-class time, they typically require six to nine hours of, per, of your own study throughout the week. So every class, regardless of the subject, subject is just an introduction. And I don't, can't think of any topic or any, or any of my degrees in which I've ever exhausted and come to know everything. 
Oh, absolutely not. And, and you know, in, in the description of these courses on their website, it's described something along the lines of, you'll have a black belt in age spirits. Well, within the class, they the very start, they tell you what we mean by black belt is you will have a foundational training in a in a controlled environment that will inform you in such a way to be able to go out into the world and begin to learn right. how to apply that. Right. So, uh, it's exactly what you're saying. You can you can take courses and 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 uh, do all sorts of training and reading and stuff, but then then actually applying it in the real world is a totally totally different thing. So I spent 18 weeks studying with uh, three master sommeliers. There were 16 people in my class. In the class, it was uh, it was through the, uh, uh, the the International Culinary School, formerly known as the French Culinary School. Mm -hmm. um, we went through about ten thousand dollars in wines. Um, and we studied uh, regions, classifications, laws, production. Uh, you study uh, every region going around, around the world. We're always doing uh, tastings, learning the, the analytical method of, of, of blind tasting and be able to uh, you know, follow a particular grid so that you could pass the uh, blind tasting. So you had the um, theory, which is all your facts and stuff. You had blind tasting and then you had service. So we also had to learn service and then we had to learn mm -hmm. um, spirits and cocktails and so forth. Um, but out of, even though we spent three hours, three to four hours, three nights a week, and then we spent on weekends, we get, we would get together and study for another 16 hours on weekends. Um, even that wasn't necessarily enough to get everybody to pass. Right. So right. Out of my class, out of my 16 people, we had one person who didn't pass, and then there was a morning class because I went, I worked in the day and then went to the evening, and then um, there was a morning class, um, and they had four or five people who didn't pass. So sure. sitting in a class isn't necessarily enough. You got to put in the work. You got to put in the uh, uh, homework. I had stacks and stacks of flashcards of memorization. You know, you just what is this? What is this? You know, flashcards, and every wine that I would taste, I would take my my iPhone snap a picture of the bottle and then I add notes to it. Mm -hmm. So I'm building a library in my head of what I had tasted and so forth. Uh, and so whether I would say if anybody else is planning on going through that course, that would be my recommendation. Treat it as an introduction. Um, you, you take pictures of every bottle. So you're building a library in your head of what you've tasted. So, and, and so what was, what was, what was that bottle we had uh, last? I can't remember. Oh yeah, go there. Here. Oh, there it was. And where are my notes? There are my notes on that particular bottle. So you're, and then, in order to understand Cabernet Sauvignon, you have to taste a, at least a hundred Cabernets before you really understand it. Right. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And and you know, applying the, some of those same uh, uh, strategies to to the whiskey world. Of course, whiskey is not quite doesn't quite work the same way as wine. Right. Right. So you're going to learn it differently, and and. Uh, uh, they do teach a lot of those de deductive tasting methods. You know, they put blind samples in front of you and you, you should figure out which one of these is malt and why, and which one of these is corn based and why, and which one of these is rye and why, and what kind of markers do you have in your head to identify these categories of whiskey? And then how can you communicate that to other people? Right. right. Ab absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah. one of the things, so, there's one thing in terms of just having, you've tasted a lot, you remember them a lot, and so you're able to do recall and do an identification with that. Scott from Scotch Test Dummies, um, no offense to Bart, but I would put my money, in terms of blind tasting, I will put my money on Scott or Bart any day. Mm -hmm. Is And Bart even says how well Scott memorizes dates and bottles and, and so on and so forth. He just He's just done a really good job not necessarily work, working at a scientific method of analyzing something, uh, but he's just built up this library of uh, of bottles and, and he remembers them, you know? Um, right. You can sort of, if you're doing videos or reviews like we do, you can actually use your own videos as a means of study. I go back and watch my own videos. I remember, I did a video on this. What, I can't remember that. I'll go watch my own video. I'm like, oh yeah, I never remember. Right, right. And that was, I mean, that the Whiskey Vault guys, that was their original concept was to make videos on a channel that would be a reference right. for those in the school, right? Right, right. I mean, of course, it's expanded to a whole other universe of things beyond that. But that was the so original. Did they, teach you how to be, did they teach you how to be, uh, you know, goofballs in class or, <laughs> or, 
Or is that a prerequisite before you get in? Hey, you yeah, it might be a little bit of a prerequisite. Uh, yeah, they're definitely good at not taking themselves too seriously and not being so serious and overbearing with knowledge to alienate people, right? right. Part of the intention is being able to bring folks into the whiskey world that are uninitiated without it feeling snobby or intimidating right. or anything like that, right? right? So you have to have that that base of knowledge to be able to have credibility with folks that are experienced, that are knowledgeable, that are maybe in the industry, et cetera. Uh, so you do know what you're talking about, but also being able to not take yourself so seriously that it puts people off. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give you I mean I'm gonna give you I'm gonna teach you something something okay. I taught it, it got cut out of the video when I was there I'm gonna mm -hmm. teach you something that I taught Daniel and Rex on how to you know just be a real expert at blind tasting right so sure. I'm, it got it did it got cut out wasn't on there so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna teach you right now okay All so right. you know how you fly in an airplane mm -hmm. uh, and you look at the plane and a lot of times the end of the wing it kind of it, it, it goes up like this so here's the wing and it goes up like this. Right, right, sure. So the purpose of that of that at the end there is to reduce drag and improve gas mileage, right? Mm -hmm. So it's more aerodynamic. Okay. This is why when you blind when you're drinking whiskey, you should stick your pinky up. Oh. It reduces oh. the drag as you bring the glass to your nose. It's better aerodynamic. Okay. Oh, for drinking the whiskey. I'm, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling the effects already. See, I always thought that was like an antenna, so you could pick up the flavors better. It's all about aerodynamics. That's all about aerodynamics. Gotcha. Okay. Oh yeah, I'm feeling the effects. That's right. Now you now you've learned from from the true master. <laughs> By the way, uh, I didn't I didn't say what was in my glass here. Oh yeah. Folks were asking, "What's everybody drinking?" I have uh, since I watched your review last night of uh, Balcony's Baby Blue, which is um, sort of the youngest, most proof down version of their blue corn whiskey. This is the older, higher proof, uh, cast strength version of their corn whiskey, uh, the True Blue cast strength. They also make a hundred proof, kind of in the middle. But this guy comes in at sixty four point two percent, so and it's twenty nine months old. The bottle I really, really liked that I couldn't bring home. And unfortunately, Jared said, oh, you should have let me know you're coming. I could have got you one. Is the Hexeros. Uh, okay, yes. yes. That was phenomenal. I, I was actually loving that that I had done with, with, with Dan. That one's spectacular. I have to love it, that one. It is fabulous, absolutely. Uh, I, I, everything they did, they, they went absolutely nuts with uh, – with 10th anniversary releases last year. It was every month. There was at least one, if not two, brand new whiskeys coming out. And uh, they were all at least interesting and at best amazing. It's sadly a lot of that doesn't make it out of the state. Right. It, the majority of that you doesn't make it out of the distillery. Right, right. right. You have to go to Waco to get it. Uh, so, which I'm is, thinking about, so I'm thinking about getting me a black Trans Am and get a buddy of mine to drive a big rig. <laughs> we could do a westbound and down. <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we we uh, we made the trek from Austin to Waco for all of these crazy releases they were doing just about every single month last year, and uh, picked up near pretty much the whole collection. So wow. Yeah. So um, let, let's talk a little bit more about about Texas. One of the things yeah. I'm I'm really glad is so I like this bourbon like very much. It's an awesome bourbon. But one of the things I was kind of like, okay, is Texas going to try to become the next Kentucky? You know what I mean? Right. Uh, or are they going to do really do something very, very different and, and really have a different identity? Um, and nothing wrong with doing bourbons. I love bourbons. Uh, you can't make a bourbon like this in California. Oh, right. On age. I mean, this, these are absolutely fantastic, superb. Uh, again, Garrison Brothers, also superb bourbons. But... Uh, I'm more impressed with the uniqueness of the single malts I've, I've tasted. Mm -hmm. And there's that other one. Um, it has a fox on it. Swift. Swift, which is another one that gets dis distribu distributed outside mm -hmm. of Texas. It's very hard to get. So I'm going to go pick up one of those. They don't have a tasting room, um, but I'm going to try to contact them, see if I can get them on. But I want to mm -hmm. review one of theirs as well. Mm -hmm. But it's really, really neat that. Balconas. I know this is turning this into Balconas uh, uh, video. But it's hard. To, it's hard not to do that because they're kind of the iconic. One, them and Garrison Brothers have been around the longest, and, right? You know, but they're, they're, they're so unique profiles that are not like anything else, and qualitatively, even though it's a different flavor and aroma profiles of their, their whiskeys, of qualitatively, they're on par with 
so, some of the some of the best I think whiskeys from Scotland, and yet at, at a third of the price, they're they're absolutely fantastic. I I tend to completely agree. Of course, uh, I'm a I'm a huge fan, and and I think it you know. Robert uh, Licorice from Iron Root probably said it's best of anybody um, when when we interviewed him uh, for our channel a while ago. He made a comment in the Barrel Warehouse as we were having a discussion. He said, why would I try to out Buffalo Trace Buffalo Trace? They're right. amazing at what they do. The Kentucky bourbon all around is a rich history and and they, they make fantastic products. And we are never really going to replicate that down here. It's a completely different environment. So why would I try and chase that? Why would I not just figure out what kind of whiskey that this place wants to make? Right. And instead of fighting the environment here, let's try and leverage it into making something that's unique, that has a specific terroir that's, that's uh, you know, unique to Texas. And I and think a lot of people are figuring that out. And they're even approaching things really different and i plan on i'm gonna have them on as well before at fact i think they're the last uh, on of my live streams they're the last ones that'll be on my channel but i've got them set up or scheduled to come on as well I'm really mm -hmm. looking forward to that um is so they learned from balconis but then they went and studied in cognac and we'll, we'll i'll get more into that when i have them on right um, and studied in cognac and so there's actually some uh, production methodologies that they actually learned from uh, making eau de vie uh, from the cognac region um, and then bringing that to making Texas whiskey, which, which I thought was really, 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 really cool. And when I when I do my review, I'll, you'll, people will see the <coughs> photography and video of everything there. And you did some really, really cool videos uh, from your visit there as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I think there's a handful of things that are happening here uh, in in multiple distilleries, whether we're talking about Iron Root or Balcones or Andalusia or Garrison Brothers. You know, when it, when an industry, uh, when a whiskey industry is young in an area like Texas, there is a tendency to use things like small five gallon barrels that were inexpensive and not a very good quality, for example. Um, th things like that and to age things really quickly that maybe, you know, s some stuff can turn out at a young age, like a uh, baby blue is a, uh, is a pleasing whiskey, but it's not very old. Um, but other things need a bit of time. They need to oxidize a little bit. They need a little bit of wood extraction, but not too much too quickly because we have such a hot environment and then it takes big temperature swings throughout the year. You know, we, we, we talk about how many Texas summers that a whiskey has gone through. Right. Right. Um, so I think there's been a transition away from the small barrels from when distilleries are just getting started. And these guys are using full size and even, you know, 53 and even larger barrels now uh, doing things like temperature controlling warehouses to a degree to try and slow that aging process down a little bit. Um, using things like used oak barrels instead of new oak barrels. I think that has a tremendous potential here uh, to let the whiskey just mature a little bit longer than, right. it, than it would in a, in a smaller new oak barrel, right? Okay. So there's all of these methodologies that are being employed, uh, proofing down in the barrel slowly over time in order to extract different flavors as the whiskey matures. So there's, there's a lot of this adaptation and creativity uh, in, in learning to deal with the environment here and leverage it to uh, our advantage in maturing the whiskey. Right. By the way, so uh, Matt said there's actually a sample of Swift in, in the box. So, uh, yeah, I'll definitely get to that. So Matt's got to come on. He gave me 20 samples. That sounds uh, like Matt. <laughs> I don't think awesome. in a live stream I'll get through all of them. Uh, <laughs> in a live stream, I might end up being laying on a floor. Ah, see it, folks. You know, I end up going out, but definitely <laughs> uh, check it out. So here's one of the things: you know, most things in life have pros and cons, weaknesses and strengths. That's just I do, you do, institutions mm -hmm. do, organizations do. California got great weather. It can't make great whiskey, but it can make great wine. It's mm -hmm. expensive here, uh, but the pollen and the pollen here is absolutely killing me. But you in may you can go snow skiing and go surfing at the beach you know you, there's there's all these things there right so mm -hmm. one of the challenges in in in, in whiskey and so i'm going to spend two weeks on uh scott's history in mm -hmm. in videos and then that'll be followed by uh, almost three weeks of uh, uh scotch whiskey business and videos on my channel 
is one of the and I know some people when it comes to history they just kind of zone out and they like I don't care I just care about what's in the glass. What you people don't understand is this is history in a glass. This Absolutely. is history in a glass, and this reflects everything that came before it, not just as climate, not just the individuals who make it, but a hell of a lot of history. And and this understanding the history of whiskey. So what happens is you had in Scotland. To make a long story short, a whole lot of shenanigans, right? People <laughs> doing stuff that's illegal, people ripping people off, people cutting corners, people doing all kinds of things that was devaluing um, the name Scotch whiskey. The result is the government has to step in, the Scotch Whiskey Association has to step in and start making definitions and defining things. What is Scotch whiskey? So they put in rules and regulations and parameters in order to protect the reputation and the branding of Scotch whiskey. The result is when you put in a lot of restrictions, it also sort of sh can shackle people as well. Right. So then you end up with um, John Glazer, uh, um, uh, Compass Box, who the one thing he wanted to introduce, inner staves and bad boy, you cannot do that. You right, a spice tree, right? Yeah, th yeah, this is not maker's mark. You can't do, you can't do what they do with that, <laughs> right? And actually, that's a practice. Uh, in fact, um, uh, Rex and Daniel just did a video in which they were talking about the private select from Maker's Mark and mm -hmm. I, and talking about the inner staves. And you can get a, a thousand one different ver variations in Maker's Mark just due to what the staves uh, that are in it. So um, you can do in the finishing in Maker's Mark, which you can't, but you can't do that in Scotland. So the pros is you protect the identity, you protect the branding, you protect a particular style. But you also shackle. So right. France, same thing. France had this whole history of people bringing in grapes uh, out of Spain and calling it Bordeaux. So they end up with classification rules and regulations. And the result is winemakers in France, they maybe they go a little bit overboard. They're they're handcuffed as to what they can do with their own and making their own wine. Right. Yeah. Contrast to that, Napa Valley, you can plant whatever the hell you want in Napa Valley. The the reg there's far less regulations. Um, not that not without regulations. There's AVA regulations. There's percentage regulations. There's you know you know in terms of what they call it a state, where you're going to have a, a, a specific vineyard on it, uh, vintage and so forth. But far less than what you have in France. So the advantage of what Texas has is because we have it would say more of the American freedom versus Scotland is they can do a heck of a lot more experimenting. Absolutely, and they do. And again, there's still some boundaries. There's still some criteria if you're going to call it a bourbon, if you're going to call it this, if you're going to call it that, and yet they can also experiment a lot as well and come with some absolutely fantastic stuff. Yeah, and and I think with Texas in particular, uh, of course we have to abide by you know if you're going to call it bourbon and has follow all the bourbon rules, etc. But um, there's not this long established history with these distilleries that have a particular flavor profile and a lot of expectations from the consumer that come with that. A lot of these guys, I mean, the oldest distilleries here are just over 10 years old. Right. So there, there's only just beginning to be a little bit of an expectation of what it means to have whiskey from Balcones and what you can expect, right? Or Garrison Brothers or Iron Root or Andalusia. Um, these guys are are kind of free to explore and experiment uh, a little bit more, I think, than 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 folks that have been around for longer and, and making fantastic product. But you know, they have they have a brand to protect a little bit more. Whereas right. these guys can can kind of get creative. Uh, speaking of, uh, I was going to pour myself one more here. The um, Iron Root Icarus that just came out right. last weekend. Speaking of creativity, I don't think it gets a whole lot more creative than this. So, so, what's unique, what, so what's unique about that particular bottle? So this is a straight corn whiskey. It's uh, 39 months old and 52.5%. And, um, and the thought here was, what if we took a corn whiskey, which is, that's a category that doesn't get much respect, right? There, right. Corn whiskey is not the most popular thing on the planet. Um, what if we took that and treated it like a fancy scotch? So they take the corn whiskey and they mature it and uh, finish it in peat, uh, peated Isla Scotch barrels. Okay, right. And port. I, I had it. I just I had it when I was there. I just don't remember. Didn't remember it. 
Yeah, it's 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 incredible. I mean, cor the corn whiskey sweetness and spice and kind of the, you know baking spices and caramels and stuff like that. But then with the fruitiness from the port, and then of course the the bit of smoky note from the Scotch barrel. Anyhow, so go ahead and pour yourself some. So you know when recently, so when I did a review uh, of the Ardbeg Drum, and I'm a big of a, a little bit of an Ardbeg fan here. Uh, yeah, um, well, just a little bit, just <laughs> just, just, just a wee bit. Is the one of the things, regardless of what bottling it is, I come away and go, does it still have something that's our begness? Right. You know, there, there's still essence. So you may call it a house style. Um, right. So one of the most important things, say in champagne, um, there are vintage champagnes, but most champagnes are a blend of vintages, and so they don't have a particular you know vintage date on it. They typically only have vintage champagnes when it's a especially good year. Other than that, they blend uh several uh years in order to produce a particular house style and by the way and so that's what don perignon that's one of don perignon's contrib uh, uh, contributions to uh, champagne he didn't invent champagne but he came the idea of uh, of doing this blending and so the same thing happens in whiskeys as well as you and this is what if you want to blind taste something you kind of go this has this this and this and this even if i've never had this before this makes me think of McCollin because there's something McCollin about this whiskey or, you know, or Springbank or, <coughs> excuse me, or, you know, Klein Leash or some other distillery. There's mm -hmm. some essence to it. Hey, uh, Jeremy from Sipper Social Club is in the house. Thank you very much. Jason Coates, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. And Jay Chung, uh, thank you very much for tuning in. Yeah, so yeah. there's sort of the still essence of a particular house style. And I think – you know, it, you, they don't have to intentionally create a house style. So, and, and so one of the things Jared and, uh, and I did last night, I always bring it music. I've people hear me talk about music. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, I bought some albums of a guitar of a guitarist named Otmar Liebert, and he's mm -hmm. sort of a fusion jazz guitarist. Have you ever heard of him? I have, yeah. I'm a guitarist myself. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So, anyway, so I, I played a long time ago, but I didn't keep it up. So um, anyway, so one of his, I remember one of his albums, I'm listening to it, and mo it's mostly instru instrumental. And then I heard this guitar in one of the songs. I'm like, that sounds like Carlos Santana. And yeah. sure enough, look at, yep, sure enough, it was Carlos Santana in there. Why? Because Carlos Santana has a particular style, a particular sound. So even if it's something you've never heard before, you still go, there's something Carlos Santana-ish ab about that. You know, the first time I heard Beat It, you know, Michael Jackson back in the 80s, Wait a minute. Eddie Van Halen's not on a Michael Jackson song, is he? Yeah. yeah. Or, uh, or you have, uh, um, what is it? Uh, Let's Dance by David Bowie, which is Stevie Ray Vaughan. Oh, right, 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 Maybe right. right. Yeah, same thing, yeah. Right. So, so in a similar way, as you can sort of blind hear a, a musician and recognize a guitar, of course, voices are the most easy to not, uh, notice, but they have a particular style. In the same way, a, a wine house or a whiskey house, it's not something they necessarily even have to try to do. You can't help doing it. If you right. have a particular place, a particular philosophy, and a particular artistry, craftsmanship to something, it's inevitable. It's going to be reflected in, in what you do. Exactly. Yeah. And, and down to, I mean, what, what type of still and how it's, pr uh, how it's produced and where it's matured and uh, all, all those things add up to sort of a fingerprint. Right, uh, right, 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 right. So, and that's just why, Hey, uh, Jason Unsworth, thank you very much for uh, t tuning in. So, um, and this is why, you know, my approach to architecture, uh, interior design, um, uh, uh, paintings, uh, music, uh, video, movies, editing, uh, literature, whiskey, wine. Those are not, for me, those are not separate and individual unrelated topics. They all fit in together in terms of having a sense of aesthetics and what yeah. is pleasing to the eye, to the ear, and, and to the palate mm -hmm. and how, and understanding them. So, so very much, so right over here, I have my, some of my Japanese stuff. And I talked about this. I had a Japanese weekend a couple of weeks ago um, and had um, Michael from uh, underneath the bottle. Uh, and he lived a couple of years in Japan. His wife is Japanese. Um, so we talked about Japanese whiskeys is and the importance of protecting the uh, Japanese whiskeys and their identity and not bringing in a bunch of stuff from outside 
and just putting Japanese labels on it is to because good Japanese whiskey reflects a place, a style, a culture, an aesthetic. And so when I got into Japanese whiskey, I also started paying attention to uh, the architecture. I started visiting uh, Japanese gardens here in the United States. And, I mean, not uh, as, as much as I could, you know. I mean, you can spend a lifetime doing this stuff. But because I wanted to understand Japanese whiskey in sort of a cultural context, which sort of brings me to my next thing. Mm -hmm. People can stereotype places, you know. Um, you know, we kind of joke around with uh, Jason uh, Mash and Drum, you know, being from New York and being a Italian, and he uses his hands and right. uh, you know, and Daniel the whiskey throttle likes to call him jabroni, you know, whatever. <laughs> joke around, you know, <laughs> you know, we kind of joke around like this, but. So, if you were to say Texas, stare cowboys and cowboy boots and country music and cowboy hats and uh, you know it's it's a big everything's bigger. Mm -hmm. So, so what would you? Th I mean, let's get a little more realistic. Yeah, uh, you know, beyond the stereotype, California is like, dude, man, go go on the beach, man, totally. Or all the surfers, for sure, yeah. for sure, dude, like totally, you know, gnarly, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <In California. laughs> um, but so what would you say then and maybe you not not necessarily have to have an answer maybe you're you know but maybe just give some thought maybe have more of an idea think about later is mm -hmm. what would you say is something about essence of texas yes climate cult climate all that but in terms of a culture and background and history you think is sort of reflective in uh texas whiskeys I would say that for the most part, I've, I've noticed a couple of things. Uh, all of all of the guys that produce whiskey around here, and, and I, I've met and know a lot of them. I mean, I, you know, Jared Hempstead and the Licorice Brothers and Ty from Andalusia and Daniel Whittington and uh, Dan Garrison, all these guys, they all know each other. They all collaborate. They all hang out when, when possible. Of course, they're all very, very hardworking people. But, you know, I've been to a lot of events where, you know, a bunch of these guys are all together in one place and they're just excited to see each other, sharing ideas, collaborating. They're all, you know, small business owners. They're all very entrepreneurial. Um, and they're, they're all very passionate and protective and believe in their brands uh, and, and sort of the craft of what they're doing as well. Uh, so I think there's a really interesting and very positive collaborative vibe. And these guys don't see one another so much as competitors, right? It's, uh, it's sort of a rising tide lifts all boats right? Uh, right. vibe. So, um, you know, that's, that's a big part of the Texas Whiskey Association, the Texas Whiskey Trail. You're getting all of these you know, for all intents and purposes, it's a bunch of alpha dogs that have to run their business and, you know, push their product and work hard to produce and be creative. And it's, you know, it's a lot of hard work that goes to, into making all of these things um, to see them all come together and support each other collectively for uh, the betterment of their entire industry in the state is, is pretty incredible. So would you, if I were to sort of put it shorter, would you sort of, that it's sort of, a collective of rugged individuals. Yes, absolutely. That that all have mutual respect and aren't. Uh, they're not keeping so many secrets from one another. Or they don't. You know, they don't see each other as enemies, right? right. Uh, they like to hang out with each other. They like to collaborate. I mean, great example of a collaboration. I've got an Andalusia whiskey uh, here. Their Striker uh, hardwood smoke single malt, finished in the rum barrels from a distillery just down the road from them, Treaty Oak. Oh, okay. Right, so there's yeah, a bunch of that, right. sharing back and forth and and collaborating and and uh, you know that everybody sort of knows each other and it's it's sort of like a little whiskey family. And I kind of like that you can see that uh, uh, not 100 percent in, in some uh, some of us whiskey tubers as well. Um, it, we become friends. Uh, mm -hmm. We we help each other out. We recommend each other's channels. We learn from each other. Um, you know, I have, so um, my process of, of doing a whiskey. So, you, you know, I do a neck pour, try mm -hmm. that. Um, I'll try it in a number of different ways. Try it neat, try a little bit of water, try it on ice, try it chilled, try, try it in a chilled glass. Um, but then when I kind of get my idea of, of it and understanding of it and my notes, I'll then watch to five or I'll Google or search on YouTube, 
okay, who has done review this one? Right. <clears throat> There's some reviewers that I probably lean I'm more like this person, a little bit more like this person, but then also go contrast. Who do I tend to disagree with? See if they pick up on stuff. And then I sort of compare notes um, not to change my perceptions or see if I'm right or wrong, but just to see if where I'm tracking uh, and what other people also sort of pick up on, on things as well. Right. Uh, and so I don't have any problem recommending other whiskey tubers uh, since I learn from them all the time. Some people I learn more in terms of the craftsmanship of making a video. Some I might learn more from uh, their approach to a particular whiskey, how they do intros, how they even schedule things, you know, just, and then, uh, you know, want to watch the channel. We'll, we'll want to comment on them and want to be um, interactive with them in, in, in their uh, uh, discussions or their comment sections down below. Want to do live streams and want to meet up with them. And it's just something I've just really, really en enjoyed in, in doing all this. Yeah, completely agree. And I've had exactly the same experience. Uh, you know, when it, one of the best things I ever learned from hanging around and uh, listening to, to Daniel Whittington, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it here, but uh, it's something like there are those out there that use uh, knowledge as a weapon to keep other people down and to make themselves look better, to put themselves on a pedestal and other people you know, are beneath them. And there are those who use knowledge to uh, help lift other people up and to help right. lead. Right. Absolutely. And uh, I have noticed both in the, you know, the distillery uh, whiskey uh, community here and then on online with the YouTube community, uh, there's a whole lot more people that want to collaborate and share and use their knowledge to help other people and lift other people up than, than uh, to use it as a weapon to, right. to keep people down. And that's that's one of the best things about the community here. Completely agree. So one of my favorite bands uh, and Vito, I, I know he likes him as well. One of my favorite bands is Rush. Yeah. And one of my favorite songs is on Hemis. I, I, Vito, if you're still in the house, I'm going to test you. <laughs> you're a Canadian. You got to you gotta represent now. Okay. I'll, I'll, and I'll, I hope he's still watching. So, Vito, so the band, excuse me, the band is Rush. The album is Hemis Hemispheres. There's one song that talks about competition. What's the name of the song? I want to see if you can come up with it. Ooh, Vito, your Canadian card is on the line now. <laughs> That's a requirement, right? To be yeah. Canadians have to have to I'll know. Be, I'll start reciting it. <laughs> it. Let's see if he gets it. Okay, here we go. Did he get it? Did he get it? Uh, okay. Nope. There is unrest in the forest. There is trouble with the trees. For the maples scream oppression and the oaks. Uh, 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 there is trouble in the forest. No, 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 no. Anyway, okay, now you should get the rest of it. Anyway, <laughs> it's the, the trees. And so the song okay. trees is, is, is about various trees competing uh, for sunlight. Uh, right, the trees, right. Um, and, and so, but the end, and the end result is they're all made equal by hatchet, axe, and saw. You know, they're all sort of right. brought down, you know. Um, and so it, it's a great song, awesome guitar, awesome message to it. Really, really like it. But it's sort of that same thing is, uh, you know, we sort of, live or die together we survive together and we have much more of a symbiotic relationship than we do <coughs> a competitive one and yet i gotta take a sip because my i'm getting a little parched <laughs> yeah no i completely agree it is a symbiotic relationship and and a, a collaborative spirit right Right okay, now now master drums mentioned la vida Strangelato. yeah that's a, that's an awesome tune but anyway we're not going to get off on sidetracked on that <laughs> so, but there's but there's also a friendly competition. So if you and I were playing chess or a video game or tennis or whatever else, we could have a friendly competition. But the end is is to be, we get better chess players get better. I don't want World of Warcraft. I don't want to help. I don't play video games. So I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> better at whatever it is we're doing because I have to get better in order to try to get beat you, and you have to get better in order to try to beat me at this chess game. Um, and so we're friendly. It's sort of like uh, uh, Professor X and uh, Magneto. Right. You know, they, they had this chess game thing, and there's this competition going on. With them. But anyway, but there's a similar thing like that, too, as well. As I see the way some of my fellow whiskey tubers, I go, 
oh, that's really, really good. Not to imitate them, but to go, I'm now inspired to work harder and try to do uh, e even uh, better. So we got about five minutes, and Chris uh, over at uh, Bourbon Insane is, is going to be going live about five oh, or six yeah. minutes. So, um, yeah, 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 Vito says uh, every song is epic from Rush. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a true Canadian. Yeah, ex well, I mean, Rush is, is just freaking. The funny thing is I actually mentioned Rush uh, with Jared as well. All right, so um, so what I've got going on, um, so doing Texas Month, really, really enjoying this. Um, in uh, June, first two weeks, I'm going to be doing Scotch Whiskey History. I'll probably, turning my schedule, I'm going to be putting out a video every day. My challenge is going to be to try to convey Scotch Whiskey History in little bites rather than super long lectures and little bites every day and yet try to keep it interesting, fascinating, uh, and not too dry. And right. still work in you know, a little bit of, of whiskey tasting along the way and then some about mid part june up until i leave for scotland on uh july 4th um i'll be doing uh whiskey business i'll then spend a couple weeks over in scotland visiting distilleries uh studying and then when i come back i'm planning on doing the rest of july will be on uh sensory analysis um and uh, deductive tasting so tips on from taking from the wine world uh, what I've learned and carried over and have to modify for the whiskey world in terms of blind tasting, to, and particularly for people who are new, who are just sort of getting started, and they pick up a whiskey and they go, "All I get is whiskey." I don't, I don't know how you know how you guys get all this. Right. So it'll, it'll be, it, it won't be, it'll be uh, try to have more of that bent to it uh, as well. So, all right. So, uh, what have you guys got going on your on your channel? I know uh, Vito had just in this uh, Canadian whiskey thing with a bunch of guys uh, from uh, up north. Uh, so what do you guys, you guys got anything particularly planned coming up on, on your channel? Yeah, uh, I, I may just completely steal that awesome idea from uh, Sipper Social Club that he put together with the uh, Canadian guys and see if I can get a bunch of Texas guys to do a, uh, a blind tasting blending challenge uh, similar to what they did. Because that, that, that was a really creative, cool idea and a, a good way, again, to collaborate with everybody. Um, and we also have, uh, I, I selected a barrel out at Iron Root. Right. And, and uh, that's going to be coming out here at a local store in Austin pretty soon with the cast strength logo on the, on the barrel select sticker no on the way. Store. Yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. Wow. It's, it, it's on its way. It's at the distributor at the moment from what I understand. So that should be, that should be coming around pretty soon. Of course, we'll, we'll let everybody know when that's coming out to the store. Um, and then, uh, we've we've talked about some new video concepts and and uh, trying to do some interesting stuff. I, I know for me, like you mentioned earlier, that we're in different cities and in two different countries, right? So it can be difficult for um, uh, for us to get on the same page and even collaborate. It'd be great if I had these guys all in the same room and we could, you know, easily share whiskey and stuff like that. So we've been talking about maybe uh, emulating a little bit of what you do. You do a lot of these collaborations and discussions and live streams with other channels. And uh, I think we may try and get to, to doing a little more of that um, to, to have it be a little more conversational and, uh, and a little bit less on the uh, solo reviews. Right. Right. Uh, we're still, still going to be doing those as well, but uh, but we, we want to start involving other people uh, more than we have been in the past. So I'll talk to you, I'll talk to you more about I'll give you some some ideas that I have. Uh, we can talk more about uh, off air because we just got a couple minutes left. So hey, if you guys haven't already, uh, go ahead and like this uh, video. If you guys haven't subscribed already, go ahead and subscribe. If you guys haven't checked out Cask Strength, uh, you want to go ahead and do that. Um, I'll put a link later on down below if I haven't already. Uh, to their channel, so you definitely want to uh, check that. And um, I'm trying to think uh, with Chad. I got to. I should. I need to talk with Chad sometime. We got to work out a time which uh, I get to bring him on uh, as as well. Or maybe oh, I don't know. he's up in he's in Canada, right? Oh, oh, sorry, uh, Brad. Yeah, Brad. Hey, Chad. Brad. <laughs> Brad, I thought you were talking about Chad from It's Bourbon Night there for a minute. No, no, no. I'm sorry. Yeah, no. Brad's in Ottawa. Yeah. No. Yeah. Hey, I'm, I'm 53 years old. <laughs> it's been a long week. When you get to, when you get to my age, you start forgetting stuff. You know, I'm lucky if I still remember right where I put my teeth when I get up in the morning. No. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Hey, right. hey again, I want to thank you very much for uh, tuning in and uh, have a good night and good weekend. Cheers, yeah, cheers everyone. Oh, Amy, thank you much for tuning in. Have a good night. <laughs>